And they did, I know he did buy in the early 1950s, just when he'd started as a lawyer in Johannesburg, a page of a Henry Moore sketchbook when there was an exhibition of those in Johannesburg. And that was in the house. But in all my childhood, there was no different status between the Matisse, which was a photo, you know, printed photographic reproduction, and the Henry Moore, which was actually his, his hand. And I think, in a sense, it was very lucky growing up with fantastic paintings that were, in fact, reproductions, rather than bad originals if they were not going to be interesting paintings. So I think that was a, a piece of, sorry, I'm asking you, a piece of um, good fortune. But I'm sure it was, he, he, my father had gone to Oxford in the sort of servicemen's, people who'd been in the war who were able to go to Oxford. He'd done his undergraduate degree in South Africa and went to Oxford. And certainly that period during the war and just after in the 1940s and late 40s was when he came across opera and museums and all of the things we kind of think of as what you'd find in a city like, like London. Um, so there was a real excitement about bringing those back. It wasn't a thought of bringing back, oh, what is the most current painting being done? It was what are the paintings, great paintings of 50 years before. Um, and I think that the way one had prints then was then taken over in later years in the way when I was a student one had walls full of postcards pinned up. One would go to every museum and every museum you'd end up at the postcard shop at the end. Where that, at that stage that was they didn't sell aprons and they didn't sell uh, sippy cups for babies. They primarily sold art books and postcards. And so you'd end up with you know, 50 postcards from a visit to the National Gallery or 20 postcards from the Courtauld. And those would be put up as kind of an aid memoir on one's, on one's walls. Thank you. Um, you've spoken incredibly eloquently about the formal techniques that you're drawn to and the things that you actually get from the pictures as to how to do something or how to help you do something. But you haven't said very much about narrative. And I'm interested because, I mean, most of your work is telling stories. And I wonder if the artists you're drawn to are the artists that you see as primarily storytellers. And if so, which artists they might be, other than the ones that you looked yeah. at at the court of? I mean, there's, there was certainly a period when I looked very closely at Hogarth. So looking at Hogarth again today, both at the, National, at the British Museum, where they've got these preliminary sketches for industry and idleness, and then at the Sir John Soane's Museum at the paintings of uh, the Rake's Progress. Is this, yeah. um, those were kind of really vital for me at a certain stage when I was trying to think, how does one find a kind of modernism that didn't forego figuration, that kept a connection to what was happening in the world, but didn't just become a reactionary illustration of something. And so Hogarth, for me, was one of the very important touchstones for that. And then, of course, Goya remains a completely vital um, artist. And I'm interested in the roots in which both go forwards and backwards from someone like Hogarth or someone like, uh, like Goya. Um, and it's, Manet is not an anomaly. I think there are very few artists who don't find him completely uh, wonderful in what he did. And his narrative paintings, and particularly his narrative lithograph of the execution of Emperor Maximilian, which was not quite at the time of the Paris Commune, and it's much more powerful than the images he made of the Paris Commune, which were of people being shot at the barricades, are kind of wonderful. But I'm actually drawn to looking at his flower paintings to talk about the Cultural Revolution in China, which is a way through looking at the political meanings of flower paintings in Chinese 15th and 16th century paintings and what's in them and what's not out. Um, I mean, it's a project ongoing, so I can't talk about it coherently at all. It's still <laughs> waiting to emerge, but I kind of, I wish that he'd painted those beautiful flower paintings under the siege of Paris, but in fact, he was outside of Paris at the time. He painted them two years later or started them two years later. Um, I'm actually going to uh, call an end to proceedings today. William uh, is flying home today, so we'd like to leave enough time uh, for that to happen without delay. Um, as as regurgitating. 
as regurgitations go, uh, this was about the most eloquent I've ever heard. So thank you both uh, so much, William Kentridge and, and Spiegelman. Thank you. That was fun. I really enjoyed that.